Amen. The sermon that I'm going to be bringing today is a sermon that I preached about two years ago. And some of you, several of you have been to me and said, please preach it again. I preach it in every revival in which I preach. I, this is a sermon that I preach. You've heard, some of you have heard this, but many of you have not heard this sermon. So for you who've heard it, laugh like you've never heard it. When I say something funny or something good, say amen, even though you've already said amen two years ago. But today I want to talk to you about the parable of the baseball diamond. We just finished the World Series, and St. Louis Cardinals, of course, defeated Detroit Tigers and are now the champions of 2006. And I watched every game. I normally don't watch a lot of baseball until they go into the playoffs now and, and into the World Series. But the words play ball signify the beginning of a game that is dear to the American heart. I guess nearly all Americans love baseball. When I was the pastor at the First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Texas, I had a lady in my church who was 80 years old, and she was a widow, and she lived right beside the parsonage, and she loved baseball. In fact, she was a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals, and I was thinking about her this week, Maud Long. And she was 80 years old, and she didn't have a television set. But in one season, she listened to 104 baseball games on the radio. She really did love baseball. A man once went to a little boy, and he said to the little boy, he said, son, if you could have just one eye, and that eye in just one place, where would you like to have it? And the little boy thought for a moment, he scratched his head, and he looked up at the man, and he said, sir, if I could have just one eye, and that eye in just one place, I'd like to have it on the tip end of my index finger so I could stick my finger through the knot hole and see the ball game. So, all the way from small children up to grandmas and grandpas, we all love baseball. Today, I would like to use the baseball diamond as a parable to portray spiritual truths. Whenever I go to preach this, I immediately think that there are some who say, well, that's not a biblical sermon. That's not a scriptural sermon. But if you'll study the New Testament, you're going to discover that the writers in the New Testament often refer to the athletic arena of the sports and field to illustrate or portray spiritual truths. Paul must have really been an athletic fan because he often referred to the athletic arena in order to portray, to, to portray spiritual truths. For example, Paul referred to the athletic arena when he said, let us run with patience, the race that is set before us. Again, he referred to the athletic field when he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And again, he referred to the athletic field to illustrate spiritual truths when he said, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. In other words, he's saying, I'm not just shadow boxing, I'm really boxing for the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I would like to use the baseball diamond as a parable to portray spiritual truths. First base represents salvation. Write that down in your notes. First base represents salvation. Now in baseball, first base is the initial base. It is the initial step. A runner cannot go to second, he cannot go to third, and he cannot come home and score until he touches first base. In the Christian life, salvation is first base. Say that with me, please. Salvation is first base. If you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 10, I want you to notice what Paul said in verses 1 through 4. Paul said it was his desire, it was his prayer that people would touch first base. Let's read it together. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is that the Jewish people might be saved. They might touch first base. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Instead, they're clinging to their own way of getting right with God and by trying to keep the law. They won't go along with God's way. For Christ has accomplished the whole purpose of the law, and whoever believes in him are made right with God. You see, Paul wanted to see people touch first base. But the people in Paul's day were trying to save themselves. They were trying to establish their own righteousness, and they were not willing to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. 
And this is the problem that we are facing in our world today. We're living in a world where men and women are trying to save themselves. Some people are trying to buy their salvation by giving to the church and charitable organizations. Other people are trying to work their way to heaven. And the key word of men's religions is do, 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 work, 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 and you'll make it to heaven when you die. Other people are dependent upon baptism to save them. They really believe that if you'll be baptized, if you'll join a church, that you will be saved. And then there are those who believe that if you join a certain church, that you will make it to heaven when you die. Listen to me carefully. It is as impossible for you to save yourself as it is for a flat tire to fix itself. You cannot save yourself. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot buy your salvation because salvation is not for sale. And if, it, if you could buy it, most of us wouldn't have enough money to buy it. But it's a free gift. God calls salvation a free gift. It's the free gift of God. Baptism cannot save you. You can be baptized so many times in the creek that every tadpole in the creek knows your social security number and still die lost and go to hell. The church cannot save you. There's no church in the world that can save you from your sins. You cannot save yourself. It is as impossible for you to save yourself as it is for a flat tire to fix itself. Well, if I cannot save myself, what must I do to be saved? I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell when I die. What must I do to be saved? The Bible tells us what we have to do in order to be saved. Look at it. First of all, we must realize and admit that we are sinners. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So before I can be saved, before I can go to heaven, I must realize and admit that I'm a sinner. That brings me face to face with the question, what is a sinner? If I must realize and admit that I'm a sinner, then I must know the definition of a sinner. What is a sinner? A sinner is anyone who is less perfect than God. Notice what it said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory, the perfection of God. In witnessing the people, I often ask the question, are you a Christian? And many times they'll say, oh, I'm as good as the next fellow. I'm as good as some of your church members. I'm as good as some of your deacons. I'm as good as some of your Sunday school teachers. But then I look them square in the face and I say, but are you as good as God? And they say, oh, no, nobody's as good as God. Well, a sinner is anyone who is less perfect than God. A sinner is anyone who has sinned at least one time. Life on every hand teaches us that men and women are sinners. Every time you see a bank, that is proof that men and women are sinners. Because if we were perfect, if we were not sinners, you could leave your money in your mailbox and nobody else would touch it. But you try doing that and your kin folks would be the first to get it. Because we're sinners. Your kin folks are sinners. I'm a sinner. Every time... You see a policeman. That is proof that men and women are sinners. Because if we were not sinners, if we were perfect, we would not need policemen. When you came to church today, you're listening to me. When you came to church today and you parked your car, how many of you locked your automobile? Why did you do that? Don't you trust these good-looking religious people here at this church? Don't you trust Brother Steve? Don't you trust our ushers? Don't you trust Doug Slate? Well, forget about that. <laughs> you see, if we were honest and just and perfect, we could leave our keys in our car and nobody would bother it. How many of you locked your car, or locked your house before you left home? Turned on the alarm system. Why did you do that? Because we live in a world that is full of sinful people. And if we were not sinful, we wouldn't have to lock our homes up and we wouldn't have to lock our automobiles up and put our money in a bank. They say that confession is good for the soul. Let's try it and see if it helps us any. Listen to me, and I need your cooperation. Have you ever told a lie? Now, I don't care if it's a black lie or a white lie or in technicolor. 
If you've ever told a lie, admit it to yourself. And if you say you've never lied, you're the biggest liar of all. Amen? So here we go. If you've ever told a lie, raise your hand. All right. How many of you have ever stolen anything? Perhaps when you were young, you stole a toy from a playmate. And I've seen some of you religious-looking, good-looking women pushing that buggy in the supermarket, at Walmart, Lowe's. And you pushed down till you got to those delicious-looking grapes. I've seen it. <laughs> and you reached out and looked around, and you got you one or two or more, and you ate them, and you didn't pay for them. You stole them, you thief. If you take something and don't pay for it, you've stolen it. Here we go. How many of you have ever stolen anything? Raise your hand. Boy, we've got a great church, don't we? Bunch of thieves, robbers, and liars. No wonder we lock our car doors and homes when we leave. Now, I'm doing that just to prove one thing is, and that is this. We are sinners in the sight of a holy God. God is holy, we are unholy. God is perfect, we are sinners. But before we can be saved, we have to admit that we're sinners. Before a man will go see the doctor, he needs to realize, or he has to realize that he's sick. Before a drowning man calls out for help, he has to realize, or she realizes, that they are drowning. So in order for you to call out to God to save you, you've got to realize that you are a sinner and admit to God that you are a sinner. Secondly, are you listening? You must repent of your sins. You don't hear repentance preached much about today. But the first message Jesus ever preached was, except you repent, you shall perish. What he said 2,000 years ago is still good today, friends. Unless you repent of your sins, you'll never put one foot on the golden streets of heaven. You must repent of your sins before you can be saved. Jesus said it, and he meant it. The Greek word is metanoia. And the word metanoia means to change your direction. You're going one way. You're walking down the path, the broad way, as Jesus called it in Matthew chapter 7. You're walking down the broad way that leads to hell. And all of a sudden, you realize that you're a sinner. You realize you need help. You call out to Jesus. You turn around. You repent. You turn your back on your sins, and you start walking down a new way, the narrow way, the way that Christ wants you to walk. It means that you leave your sins behind. You become a new person. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall perish. Then the third thing that you must do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Acts chapter 16 for just a moment. In Acts chapter 16, we are told that Paul were, and Silas were arrested and beaten and cast into prison for preaching the word of God. The Bible tells us that at midnight, they started singing praises to God. And God was looking from heaven, and God called the earthquake angel. And he said to the earthquake angel, I want you to go down there and shake that prison. And you talk about jailhouse rock. There was jailhouse rock. Notice what happened beginning in verse 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the prisoner and the keeper of the prison, awakened from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword when he was about to kill himself. But Paul said cried out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What did Paul and Silas tell him? They tell him to join a church? No. They tell him to be baptized? No. They tell him to start tithing? No. Notice what Paul and Silas said in verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Let your eyes focus upon the word believe. The Greek word is pistuo, and it's not talking about intellectual belief. The devils believe in Jesus. The devils believe that Jesus, the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, 
that he lived a perfect life and that he conquered death. The Bible tells us the devils believe and tremble. So it's not talking about intellectual belief. So what does the word pistuo mean? It means to commit your life to. The devils believe in Jesus, but they've never committed their lives to Jesus. Some people in our world today believe that Jesus lived, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, but they've never committed their lives to Jesus. They've never repented of their sins and committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can take a man and you can eucalize him and you can canonize him and you can idolize him and you can simonize him. But unless that man believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to hell when he dies. Salvation is not a progress. You don't behave yourself into the kingdom of God. You don't progress in, into becoming a child of God. It is a moment in life when you repent of your sins and commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Can you come to me after the service and say, Pastor, I can tell you where I was when I repented of my sins and I committed my life to Jesus and I invited Jesus to come into my life. Man's greatest need is to touch first base. Before you graduate from high school, before you go off to college, before you join some military service, before you do anything, before you get married, you need to touch first base. Second base represents joining the church and being baptized. Fill in your notes. It represents joining the church and being baptized. This is the second step in the Christian life. After a person has been to first base and they've touched first base, then they ought to go to second base and they ought to touch second base and they ought to join the church and they ought to be baptized. But you know what? The tragedy of our day is that many people have been born in the batter's box of life and they've cut across the pitcher's mound. And there they stand out there on second base. They've joined the church and they've been baptized, but they never touch first base. They've never repented of their sins. They've never committed their life to Jesus. They just cut across the pitcher's mound and joined the church. Today our churches are full of baptized pagans. Men and women who have just joined the church and they've been baptized, but they've never repented of their sins. There has not been a change in their life. They still commit the same old sins over and over again. They've never made a commitment of their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. They are lost without Jesus. Now, Billy Graham said, and I quote him, he said, I sometimes believe that 75% of all church members are lost. They've never accepted Jesus as their Savior. A lot of them have their name on the church roll, but they don't have their name on the Lamb's book of life in heaven. A lot of them have taken from the cup of communion, but they've never taken from the cup of salvation. They're members of the church, but they're not members of the kingdom of God. The church has become a fill for evangelism when it was meant to be a force for evangelism. Sometimes I believe that we, we, it would be wise for us to close our church doors and try to get our church members converted before we convert the world. End of quote. Wow. And that makes me wonder how many people are here today. And you're members of a church and you've been baptized. But you've never repented. You've never committed your life to Jesus. You've never touched first base. You see, if you're not saved, your church membership will do you no good. You may be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Catholic or an Episcopalian or a Church of Christ or a Vegetarian. Or as one African-American preacher said, and I like this, he said, a member of any other abomination and still die lost and go to hell. He said, if you have only church membership when you die, you're going to hit hell so hard it will take the devil a month to plug up the hole. End of quote. Take inventory. Examine yourself. Go back and relive the moment that you repented. Relive the moment that you committed your life to Jesus. Make sure that you've touched first base. You should never join a church. You should never be baptized until you've touched first base. You say, well, pastor, can you prove that? You bet your life. In Acts chapter 8, we have a beautiful and clear picture of this. In Acts chapter 8, we find the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Bible says that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch was riding in a chariot. They were talking about scriptures. They were reading from the book of Isaiah. 
Philip was telling him about Jesus, the fulfillment of that passage of Scripture. They came to some water, and the eunuch said to Philip, What keeps me from being baptized? There's some water. And look at verse 37. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Friends, that's the New Testament way. Amen? First you're saved, and then you join the church. Then you're baptized. I believe, with all of my heart, that when a person really gets saved, they will want to join a church, and they'll want to be baptized. I cannot understand, I try to, but I can't understand how a person can claim to love Jesus and yet not love the bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be foolish for me to say, I love baseball, but I don't like the baseball diamond. I love to swim, but I don't like the swimming pool. I love to play tennis, but I don't like the tennis court. That's foolish. If a man loves baseball, he'll love the baseball diamond. If he loves football, he'll love the football field. If he loves to swim, he'll love the swimming pool. If he loves to play tennis, he'll love the tennis court. And I really believe with all of my heart that if a person really loves Jesus, he'll love Jesus' church. He'll want to be a part of it. Oh, I know we're not perfect. I know that they're hypocrites. We all are hypocritical in one way or another. But if you love Jesus, you'll love Jesus' church. Third base represents Christian service. Write it down. Christian service. Now then, let's look at the bases. Here's the tragedy of our day. Some people just cut across the pitcher's mound. I've talked to you about that. But some people have gone to first base, and they've touched first base, and they've repented of their sins, and they've committed their life to Jesus. But then they took a rocking chair with them. And there they sit out there on second base, just a rocking, doing nothing for the Lord. Not using their spiritual gifts, not using their spiritual talents, just a rocking. They come sometimes on Sunday morning, listen to a little sermon, go away and show up in another month or two. They might give a little bit every now and then. They just like to rock. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. I've come to tell you, and I don't apologize for this. God wants you to serve him, and Jesus expects you to serve him. Today we have too many bench warmers and not enough players. Some people have warmed the same pew so long it looks like they would produce something. That's what a chicken does when a chicken sits in the same place for a long period of time. God doesn't measure men by his income but by his outgo. God doesn't measure us by how many servants we have but how many people we have served. God expects you to serve him. He doesn't expect you after you've been saved to roll up your sleeves and say, well, I'm going to take it easy. Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't roll up his sleeves and say, now nah, I've been converted and I've touched first base and I'm not going to burn any more churches and I'm not going to purse any more, any, any more Christians. He didn't do that. He rolled up his sleeves and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Every person has spiritual gifts and talents. When you're saved, God gives you those spiritual gifts and God gives you those talents. And God wants you to use them. He wants you to go to third base and serve him. I heard about two men who were standing on a street corner. One was about six foot eight and weighed about 300 pounds, and the other was about four foot eight or nine and weighed about 80 pounds. And the little man looked at the big man, and they were talking. He said, man, you're big. He said, if I was as big as you, I would go out in the woods and find me a bear and choke it to death with my own hand. The big man looked at the little man and said, there's some little bears out there too. <laughs> Maybe you can't sing in the choir. Maybe you can't play in the ensemble. Maybe you can't play a musical instrument. Maybe you can't teach. But I tell you this gospel truth, when you got saved, God gave you a spiritual gift and a spiritual talent. 
And God expects you to use that spiritual gift and that spiritual talent to build his kingdom on this earth. The church needs you. Get up out of the rocking chair. The Lord needs you. Get out of the rocking chair and serve the Lord. Well, home base represents heaven. Here's how I would like for my life to be. I'd like, I've touched first base when I was 14 years old. I repented of my sins. I've committed my life to Jesus. I joined the church. I got baptized. I've been to third base, and I started preaching in 1960. And I've been preaching the gospel of Christ since 1960. I told somebody the other day, I have an old hunting dog that's just, you know, J.C. Ryerson and I own a hunting dog together. And, and this dog is old and I came from Kansas and it's about, I don't know how much time it's got left, to be honest about it, but he's a great dog. I told J.C. the other day, J.C. said he's going to die out in the field. I said, but I'd rather for him to die in the field than die in the, in the lot. And I'd rather die preaching the gospel than to die in some hospital room. My dream is this, that the Lord would come back even while I'm preaching. And if not, that God let me die in the pulpit and that I'd go to heaven. And I haven't lived a perfect life and I haven't been a perfect person, but I would hope that the Lord would welcome me. Welcome home, John, thou good and faithful servant. There's a place called heaven. If we could just scroll back the ceiling and scroll back the heavens and God could give a spiritual vision to look up there, you'd see your grandmother and your great-grandfather and you'd see your husband and you'd see your wife and you'd see some of your children. You'd see friends of long ago and friends who've gone recently. You might see a dear loved one up there. And they're up there in a land where they'll never grow old. They'll never get sick and that's where we're going when the Lord comes back or we die if we've touched first base. In 1924, New York and Washington played in the World Series. Students of the game say that it was one of the best World Series ever played. They were evenly matched. And I went on Google yesterday and just pulled up old newspapers. And then I pulled up the greatest World Series ever played. And, of course, each author had a different opinion. But many said 1924 was the greatest World Series ever played. The teams are so evenly matched. New York won three games and Washington won three games. The first game went into 12 innings. It was a fantastic World Series. The closing game, the deciding game, was going to be played in Washington. Whoever would win this game would be the world champions for 1924. Fans packed the ballpark for the crucial event. And as they went into the ninth inning, the score was tied two and two. New York came up to bat, and all of the New York fans began to scream and holler. They began to stomp their feet and clap their hands for one Run, one, just one run that would win the ball game. Three up, three out. Then the Washington Senators came to bat. First man up made an out. Second man up came on, made an out. Third man up by the name of Goose Goslin. He stepped up to the bait, up to the base, and you know how they do. They they step back and they spit and get dirt all over them and rub the, all the body. You know, you know how what he went through. He gets in there and ball one. Steps out and goes through the same procedure they do it every time. Step back in, strike one, ball two, strike two. On the fifth pitch, the catcher gave the signal for a fastball. Outside corner. The pitcher wound up with all of his might. And he threw that leg up and he just threw that fastball as hard as he could. And Goshen was standing in the plate and when he did, he stepped into it and he cracked it with all of his might. And it started toward left center field. It looked like it was going to be a home run. The outfielder started running toward left center field to retrieve the ball just in case it fell and 
side of the field to play, but it did look like it was going to be a home run. But with a resounding thud, it hit six inches below the clearing point. By this time, Goshlin had touched second and was going to third. The outfielder picked up the ball and spun. He threw it to the shortstop. And the coach, seeing, seeing that this might be their best opportunity to win the game, gave the signal for him to stretch a triple into a home run. So Goshlin put his head down and like a freight train, he headed toward home base. The shortstop retrieved the perfect peg from the outfielder and spinning, and turning around and threw a perfect peg to the catcher who was squatted over the plate. Goshlin slid seemingly a split second ahead of the ball. The catcher tagged him. There was a cloud of dust. And when the dust cleared, the umpire raised his hand and said, You're out! But it seemed like he was safe. In fact, I even made a copy of one of the articles. Everybody went wild. The Washington Senators players started running out on the field with baseball bats in their hand. Kill the ump! The people in the stands started throwing things. This hit, this hit, hit right here. They threw they went crazy, it says. They threw soda bottles and beer bottles and yelled at senators at the umpires. So the man behind the plate told the crowd that he would confer with the other men in black. And they talked together for a little while. It's just a few seconds, but it seemed like an hour to the people that were waiting for their decision. And then the umpire walked over to the announcer and gave the decision. And the announcer turned toward the grandstand with a megaphone and said, Ladies and gentlemen, the man is out at home because he did not touch first base. How will it be with you, young people? Adults, when it comes to the end of your journey and you slide into home base and you say, I'm safe, I've made it. Only to hear the great umpire of the universe say, I'm sorry, you're out. You never touched first base. Every time I tell that story, somebody comes to me at the end of the says, who won? Well, that game went 12 innings. That would have been the winning run if it touched first base. It went 12 innings, and Washington Senators won. Have you touched first base? Have you touched first base? Have you touched second base? Have you joined the church? Have you been baptized? Are you sitting in a rocking chair? Are you touching third base? Are you using your gifts and your spiritual talents to serve God? Are you going to receive a welcome home well done, thou good and faithful servant? What about it? How's it with you? Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? If you've never touched first base, in just a moment I'm going to ask you to come and sit down on the front pew and just say to one of our church counselors, I want to touch first base today. If you doubt that you've touched first base, maybe you're a member of the church and you've been baptized, but you can't remember when you repented and you can't remember when you believed and committed and you'd like to make sure you come and sit on the front pew. Maybe you are here and you've touched first base and you've been saved, but you need to join the church or you need to be baptized. You come, you sit on the front pew. And then if you're here and you're sitting in that rocking chair and I started to count how many times, I don't know how many times I've preached this sermon, but I've had people to come up to me across America and they've said to me, boy, you painted a perfect picture of me. I'm the one sitting in the rocking chair. If you're sitting in the rocking chair, you just get right with God. That's between you and God. The altars are open. Lord, Take hold of this service. I just got a feeling there's some people here that's never touched first base. I've got a feeling that there's some people here who 
members of the church, but they don't know for sure that they've touched first base. Maybe there's some people here who need to touch second. Maybe a lot of us need to get out of our rocking chairs and serve you. You just take over now, Lord, as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Who will be the first one to come? If you'll come, maybe someone will follow you and someone else will follow you. Let's stand as we see. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is called.